Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. I invite you to remain standing for the national anthem, which will be sung by Miss Angel Joseph. Isle of beauty, Isle of splendor, Isle to all so sweet and fair. Oh, must surely gaze in wonder at thy gifts so rich and rare. Rivers, valleys, hills, and mountains, all these gifts we do extol. Healthy so like all fountains giving cheer that warms the soul dominica god has blessed thee with a climb benign and bright pastures green and flowers of beauty filling all with pure delight and a people strong and healthy full of godly reverent fear may we ever seek to praise thee for these gifts so rich and rare come ye forward sons and daughters of this gem beyond compare strive for honor sons and daughters do the right be firm be fair toil with hearts and hands and voices we must prosper sound the call in which everyone rejoices all for each and each fall please be thank you very much miss joseph please be seated Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Honorable Joseph Isaac, Speaker of the House of Assembly. Honorable Dr. Vince Henderson, Minister of Planning, Economic Development, and Renewable Energy. Other honorable members of cabinet. Your Excellency Francine Barron, Chief Executive Officer, Creed. Your Worship, Kerry Brady Prince, Mayor of Portsmouth, Permanent Secretaries, Mr. Isaac Solomon, Vice President, Caribbean Development Bank. Ms. Kim Osborne, Executive Secretary for Integral Development, OAS. Pastor Eddie George, members of the media, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to the opening ceremony of the high-level conference on building a science and data-based agenda for decision-making on resilience in the Caribbean. 
Let me extend a very warm welcome uh, to those of you who are visiting us in Dominica, whether for the first time or if you've been here before. This is a great time to be in Dominica. This is our independence time. We are celebrating, we are all smiling, we are happy, and you can see our smiles today without our masks. <laughs> I am going to invite at this time Pastor Edie George to lead us in prayer. Can I please ask you to stand as we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your name is above every name. We give you honor, we give you glory. We welcome your presence in this place, God. We honor you, for you are our sovereign God, the mighty God, the creator of the universe. You held the mountains in your hands. You you are the one who created and formed this land. You made us to dwell here. We thank you for your love towards us. Thank you for your love and kindness and your tender mercies. We thank you, Father, for your grace towards us. Thank you, Father, for your love that keeps us. Father, we thank you even today, even as we come here to, to be able to um, discuss ideas. We thank you for giving us good ideas. Give us great ideas. Give us, Father, ideas be beyond our capacity and imagination, God. As we, as we try to deal with the, the circumstance, the vulnerable, to protect those, those who are vulnerable, those who are, those who are God, that, that you have given us under your, your care. Let your love surround them, Father. Let your love surround us, almighty Father and precious God. You made everything good in your, in your time. We thank you for the leaders, God, that you have brought here. You said that we should pray for leaders, pray for our leaders, pray for those that are in authority. We, th we cover the leaders, God, even as they grasp and they grab with and try to navigate with the, the challenges of this time. You said in, this, in the last days, per perilous times shall come. We thank you for giving them wisdom and guidance and understanding and protection to be able to maneuver, to be able to manage and to lead in this, in this trying times, in these turbulent times. We thank you, God, for every, every nation that is represented here, every representative that is here from across the Caribbean. Father, we thank you for the spirit of unity and oneness, even as we come together with one voice, with one mind, to be able to, to chart the course forward for the nations of the Caribbean, for our people. We thank you, Father, for bring, giving them brilliant ideas as we, as we discuss the issues. We thank you, God, for your, for your blessings upon us, even as they spend this time in, in Dominica, the isle that you have given us, the isle of beauty, isle of splendor. We thank you, God, for every, every one that will be that will be speaking tonight. We thank you for the proceeding. We thank you for this, for this, this ceremony, God, that it will go well, that it will go free. We thank you, Father, that everything that is planned here, everything that is set out here, it shall come, come to fruition. It shall complete it. You say, for he that has begun a good work in us is able to bring it to completion, bring it to fruition. We thank you that you, will, that you will bring it to pass in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for blessing each and every one of us, even as we give ourselves to you. And we don't know what to do, that we can turn to you we can lean to you. We can cast all our cares on you because we know that you care for us. We thank you, you said in your word that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then you will hear from heaven. You will forgive our sins and you will heal our land. Help us, Father, to be agents of healing to our lands, to our nations. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray and God's people say, Thank you very much, Pastor Eddie George. We do appreciate the words of prayer and exhortation. At this time, to formally welcome you, I would like to invite Ambassador Francine Barron, our Chief Executive Officer of Creek. Thank you very much, CAPSEC. Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Honorable Joseph Isaac. Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Dr. Vince Henderson, Minister for Planning, Economic Development, Climate Resilience, Sustainable Development, and Renewable Energy, other honorable members of cabinet, Your Worship, Kerry Breedy Prince, Mayor of Portsmouth, Ms. Karen Prevo, Acting Secretary to the Cabinet, Permanent Secretaries, Mr. Isaac Solomon, Vice President of the Caribbean Development Bank, Mrs. Kim Osborne, Executive Secretary, for Integral Development, Pastor Eddie George, members of the media, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
Greetings and good evening. We have several reasons to be excited and optimistic this evening. First, we are in Dominica, the nature island of the Caribbean. You, you can plainly see the natural, spectacular beauty all around you. You would have seen that today. That Dominica has regenerated itself after being stripped bare by Hurricane Maria in 2017. I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you who have come from neighboring territories and beyond. Secondly, we have gathered with us an impressive group of scientists and technicians who will deliver insightful, probing, and deep dive presentations, examining the theme, building a science and database agenda for decision making on resilience in the Caribbean. Thirdly, we are building something that will strengthen our, our region and help us to fortify ourselves and our people from the devastating impacts of climate change, something that we hope can be an example for the rest of the world. How effective we are will depend on our commitment and willingness to let science and data guide our actions. Dominica's resilience journey has been well documented, and I dare say that we have become somewhat of the poster child for resilience in the Caribbean. It is a label born out of necessity as we seek to lead by example. Those who have visited Dominica post Hurricane Maria frequently remark that if you were not ac acutely aware that Dominica was decimated by a category five hurricane just five years ago, it would be difficult to, to tell today. And I am sure that those of you who saw the pictures of devastation and destruction in 2017 would agree from what you have seen thus far. Dominica's remarkable resilience, recovery, and restoration in the wake of catastrophic devastation has been likened to the phoenix rising from the ashes. I can safely attest to the indomitable strength and individual resilience of our people and a government who blatantly rejected defeat. However, the unenviable strength of our people is not enough. The Caribbean region is acutely threatened by climate change, particularly our small island developing states and Dominica is no exception. We are situated in the tropical cyclone belts and are directly exposed to the forces of the oceans and storms. As a small geographical area, disasters tend to affect the entire country when they strike. Availability of quality statistics and reliable data are crucial to effectively respond to the effects of climate change and build resilience. These help us know the scope and magnitude of problems whether we have enough resources to fix the problem and whether we are making progress towards resolving them. Having good indicators can help us measure accurately and understand where gaps are, particularly in terms of the availability of data and when we need to go back to the drawing board, rethink methodologies or parts of a strategy or plan. They can also allow us to see where there are convergences, avoid duplication of efforts and better use of resources. The Central Statistics Office of Dominica, for example, produces a report on environmental statistics, which captures some of the indicators which forms part or could contribute to the development of the climate change and disaster indicators. Regrettably, there are inconsistencies in data quality, low response rates to data requests, difficulty contacting some stakeholders for information, data not available in the required format and data gaps. Hence, this is the reason why the two days spent here sharing and the follow-up sessions that will take place are so critical. Dominica is on a trajectory towards becoming the world's first climate resilient nation. This is a national goal to which all our plans, projects, programs, and policies are aligned. As such, we have plans and strategies which move across all sectors. We hope that coming out of your deliberations over these two days, there can be a clear path charted on actions that we can take to further build our resilience. And I am reliably informed that some of you have had the opportunity to visit our Trafalgar Falls and the Boiling Lake. There is a lot more to explore in Dominica. You can hike through our rainforest to see the most spectacular views, visit our sulfur spas, swim in our crystal clear rivers and pools, and swim with our sperm whales. So feel free to spend the next two weeks in Dominica. <laughs> With that pitch, I once again welcome you to the Commonwealth of Dominica. Welcome. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I can assure you, just joining with Ambassador, if you spend just the next week in Dominica, it'll be one you will never forget. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much for those welcome remarks, Ambassador. At this time, it is my pleasure to welcome Ms. Kim Osborne, Executive Secretary for Integral Development of the OAS. Of course, Kim is one of us, a Dominican, and we're very proud to have her here with us this evening. Thank you, Capsack. And I'm being a little vain and not wearing my glasses. Good evening. Honorable Prime Minister Roosevelt Scarrett. Honorable Joseph Isaac, Speaker of the House of Assembly. Honorable Dr. Vince Henderson, Minister for Planning, Economic Development, Climate Resilience, Sustainable Development, and Renewable Energy. Other honorable members of Cabinet, Ambassador Francine Barron, Chief Executive Officer of the Creed. Your Worship, Kerry Breeding. Sorry, I think the light has gone off and I suddenly can't see. <laughs> Mayor of Portsmouth, Ms. Karine Prevost, Acting Secretary of Cabinet, Permanent Secretaries, Mr. Isaac Solomon, Vice President of the Caribbean Development Bank, Pastor Eddie George, Distinguished representatives of the private sector and partner organizations who are joining us here today. Members of the press, other distinguished guests, fellow Dominicans, good evening. I cannot begin to express just how happy I am to be here this evening and to see this event become a reality. This event, which is a subject of vital importance to the sustainability of the Caribbean. The technical conference, this technical conference was conceived as far back as 2018, after an active and destructive hurricane season that affected several countries in the Caribbean, including Antigua and Barbuda, and our host country, Dominica. In the wake of that experience, we began to think anew of the ways in which the OAS could assist the vulnerable member states of the Caribbean to break the cycle of disasters caused by hazard events and other external shock and move towards resilience. We decided on two complementary interventions, a project to help build the resilience of small tourism enterprises to disasters, and a technical conference aimed at fashioning a regional program and framework to improve the use of science and data in decision making for resilient and resilience and sustainable development. As fate would have it, the COVID-19 pandemic intervened. And while we were able to proceed with the execution of the tourism resilience project using mostly virtual methods, we believed in an in-person event would, would be better, an in-person event would be better suited for the second intervention. Very early in the planning, we decided on Dominica as the ideal venue for this event. I assure you that this decision had nothing to do with the fact that I am from Dominica <laughs> and everything to do with the fact that the Nature Isle made itself a natural choice to host this technical conference by virtue of the credible steps it has taken to become the first climate resilient small island developing state in the world. Dominica has made credible and impressive steps to move beyond the rhetoric on resilience towards institutionalizing a culture of resilience at all levels of its society and in all sectors of its economy. True to form, the government of Dominica readily agreed to host this conference and I wish on behalf of the General Secretariat of the Organization of American States and all of us gathered here today and online to thank Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt for lending his immediate and strong personal support and that of the government of Dominica for this initiative. I thank Ambassador Francine Barron, the CEO of the Creed, for her personal support as well as that of our many partners. I especially want to recognize our first partner to come on board, Amazon Web Services, the Inter-American Development Bank, 
the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, IAI, NOAA, the CAF, and other partners for their pivotal support in making this event possible. But most of all, I thank all of you who have traveled from near and far to share your intellect and expertise with us. Drawing from our experience at the OAS in arranging air travel for many of you and your own experience in getting here, I wish to say that the challenges of air travel in the Caribbean pose a serious threat to the region's resilience and thus must be speedily and irrevocably addressed. At the OAS, we are very clear that we are, what we are embarking on today is more than an event, but rather a first step towards fashioning a cooperation framework and action program for the establishment of a support system to help Caribbean countries to routinely use data and science in decision making that leads to social, economic, and environmental resilience. We decided to cast a wide net and to examine resilience in all its, very, in its various dimensions, as well as in the context of the synergies between them, between these, inter these dimensions. Additionally, recognizing the compounding challenges and shocks routinely be being faced by the region, we decided to adopt a multi-hazard approach. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced these essential points. points. One, that resilience building must be embraced as an evidence-based decision-making process, including governments, social partners, and citizens. Two, resilience will not be achieved by any of these actors acting alone. And three, if citizens are not resilient, governments and the private se sector will remain vulnerable and vice versa. We have seen clear evidence of the importance of citizen resilience here in Dominica and throughout the Caribbean, following the passage of hurricanes and other natural disasters. For example, hotels that are readily, ready, not badly hit and are ready to open very often cannot do so because their workers are preoccupied with rehabilitating and in some cases rebuilding their homes and their lives. Environmental or ecosystems resilience is another area that in our view is not receiving the attention it deserves in discussions on resilience. The science and data from hazard events in the Caribbean and elsewhere clearly show that natural ecosystems like coral reefs mangroves, seagrass, bed, seagrass beds, can help avert full-blown disasters, provided that they are maintained in a healthy state. We are pleased that this critical area of resilience is receiving attention from a consortium of regional and international agencies, some of whom are present with us today. In designing this technical conference, we have taken account of the fact that there are many resilience initiatives either being implemented or are planned in the region. Among the other things, we are aiming to do the following. One, build our general awareness of who is doing what and where to routinely use science and data for resilience building and with what results. Two, generate ideas on how ongoing initiatives can be scaled up and replicated across the region. And three, agree on a framework of South-South and triangular cooperation and partnerships among national governments and regional and international agencies and the private sector to provide sustained support to enable the region to move from vulnerability to resilience through the regular use of science and data. In keeping with its mandates, programs, and cooperation arrangements, the OAS is ideally placed and is willing to play the role of convener and coordinator in building a partnership framework to carry forward the decisions taken at this meeting. Within the context of the Secretariat for Integral Development, which I have the great honor to lead, many of our current programs 
are, can already fuel the science and data-based agenda. The Secretariat for, Inter for Integral Development convenes 11 high-level sectoral ministerial meetings on areas of priority for development, including science and technology and sustainable development. These ministerials are ideal spaces to enable, to enable consensus building among and within OAS member states, facilitate cooperation and advance private-public partnerships. In December 2021, ministers and high-level authorities of science and technology adopted the Declaration of Jamaica on harnessing the power of transformative technologies to drive our communities forward. The Declaration established a framework to advance results-oriented regional cooperation on science, technology, and innovation in the Americas for the period 2022 to 2024. It includes a call to action for the region to make science and technology and innovation a fundamental component of the economic recovery and an integral part, a factor to promote inclusive, green, resilient, and sustainable growth in the societies of the Western Hemisphere. Under the leadership of Jamaica, some of the concrete initiatives resulting from the ministerial include the development of the OAS regional network of centers of excellence focused on top transform transformative technologies to improve collaboration on research, the sharing of science and data-driven inputs for decision-making. Our centers of excellence on transformative technologies will serve as research and innovation hubs for foresight on 10 transformative technologies, including artificial intelligence, quantum com computing, big data, blockchain, robotics, among others. Already, centers have been established in Hidalgo, Mexico on blockchain, robotics, and artificial intelligence in Barranquilla, Colombia. And the OAS is currently working with other partners for centers on nanomaterials in Lima, Peru, the Siena Center for Artificial Intelligence of Chile. We envision the Center for the Blue and Green Economy will be hosted, and we hope that it will be hosted in the Caribbean. Our Youth Academy on Transformative Technologies, with, which is designed to certify 10,000 young people by 2024 for jobs in the digital and virtual economies, is another platform that we hope to make available to support these initiatives. Our scholarships and training programs will focus on training and certification on climate smart skills to provision the green and blue economies. Finally, the America's Competitiveness Exchange, geared towards building partnerships for spurring investments and undertaking joint research for economic resilience, is another key support mechanism. And we endeavor to build, as we endeavor to build the decision-making support system in the region. We confidently anticipate the continued support of all of our partners, those who are here to with us today, as well as, the as those who could not join us due to extenuating circumstances. And you know I believe in an alliance model for development. I believe in a partnership model for development. I think each and every one of us has a role to play. Governments cannot do it alone, and we have to get the support and intervention of both academia, the private sector, and other communities to support the development agenda in the region. So I do hope that everybody will join us in that quest. I and my team look forward to working with all of you over the next day and beyond. This is a process to which we are fully committed. It is essential to our existence as a region, as nations, and as a people. We can and we must move towards making this decision-making support system for resilience in the region a reality. The future of our region is counting on all of you, and I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Osborne, and thank you for sharing with us some of the work that the OAS is doing in the region to support climate resilience, and thank you also for choosing Dominica as a destination for this event once again. And um, I know, as um, Ms. Osborne said, that some of you experienced some difficulty getting to Dominica, but I'm sure once you landed and you got to Dominica, it was worth the trouble. 
As you have heard from the previous two speakers, um, Dominica has been on a quest towards um, climate resilience, particularly after Hurricane Maria. And one of the things that has been done, as the previous speakers have said, is that we have institutionalized climate resilience within the public sector. So we do have a ministry, a ministry with the, the portfolio uh, of climate resilience. And this evening, Honorable Dr. Vince Henderson, the Minister for Planning, Economic Development, Climate Resilience, Sustainable Development, and Renewable Energy will now deliver some remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary to the Cabinet. Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Joseph Isaac, Parliamentary colleagues, Kim Osborne, Executive Secretary of CD, Ambassador Barron, CEO of Creed, other distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I usually have the challenge of sticking to a script. So I do hope that you'll forgive me if I veer away. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to read what they gave me. Um, but I, having sat with you today and being part of the discussion, and having interacted with some of you on the margins of this conference, I, there are a few things that emerge, you know, that keep coming back to me, as a matter of fact, that I think we, I would like to share this evening. And since the very, um, I remember there was an assistant secretary general to the, to the CARICOM who once told me, when the head is up, the shoulder should remain still. So the prime minister is here, he'll speak for me. I will now seek to share with you from my own technical capacity what I picked up in some of the discussions that have been taking place. But before I do that, I just wanted to inform you that the, the manager of the Kempinski Hotel has informed me that everyone who is staying here will have three accommodation till independence. So you're okay. <laughs> but I just want to, some, there are a few things that I, I picked up. We had a distinguished, very distinguished team of scientists this morning. And I was impressed with the the content of their presentations. But a few things, as I said, keep coming back at me. And one of the key things, having lived through, you know, the, the recent hydrometeorological events in Dominica, Tropical Storm Erica, and of course, Hurricane Maria, that the, the need for data and the importance of science in decision making is really, in fact, critical. But the questions that I have for, for us, those of us who will be responsible, especially as you of Creed and all the scientists among us, what exactly it is that we're collecting? The relevance of that data. How do we collect the data? But most importantly is what do we do with that data? And, and there I'm talking about the interpretation of data. And when, which leads me to the next, the next step. What, how do we apply the outcome of all of this work that we're doing? The application. Because it seems to me that people, when they hear about science and data, they think we're just wasting our time because some of us are too academic. And I don't think that very often people are able to connect the importance of data and science to decision making. But part of it is the responsibility of the scientists and those who are collecting, interpreting, and presenting data. Because for some reason, people have become so pure in their science that they seem to believe that there is no connection between policy and politics. OK, breaking news. We only have governments because people vote for politicians. They actually vote for them. And when they vote for them, they have to represent them. And when they represent them, they're accountable to them. So a lot of our experts, our technicians, they don't seem to make the connection between politics and policy and therefore we don't get the best quality advice so that we can make the right policy decision because so we can talk about data and science and all of this and keep them in a vacuum unless we're talking about pure science where obviously you know it is pure science and that is the research and development we depend on so that we can enjoy a lot of the things that we enjoy today 
I mean, imagine us living without our data on our phone. I mean, science brought that to us, but sometimes we curse the science. It is not the science that is the problem. It is the interpretation, the use, the application, the relevance, and how we make policy decisions based on science. So I wanted to share that with you. But Dominica has a story, as Ambassador Barron said, with resilience building. And after the impact of Hurricane Maria, our Prime Minister immediately made the commitment that Dominica will become the first climate resilient nation in the world. Now, some people thought that was just stock or aftershock. But we have seen, since 2017, the gradual development of a climate resilience program in Dominica. The creed is there. They, they have produced good policy documents and roadmaps. The CRRP is there, the NRDS there, and we have the m and &E for a number of areas where we seek to monitor and evaluate and see how well we're doing. But after we've done all this and we have overlaid the data and we see where the vulnerabilities are and we know how we can use it for spatial planning, for physical planning, for development and policy choices, what is required that, I'm sorry you, you're not qualified to discuss that, that there are two essential or even critical components that are required to take that policy decision and bring it to life. Obviously, finance. But the second one that is we in Dominica have become so used to that sometimes we take for granted is strong and determined leadership. You can have all the data, all the science, all the nice stuff. If you don't have money to do it, it will never get done. But if you don't have the leadership that can drive the right policy initiatives, it will, it will be of no value to anyone. And this is where I say, again, people lose confidence in the work we do because we are not able to take those and, and bring them to life. Dominica, after just a, a brief story, after Tropical Storm Erica destroyed two communities in the south of the island, we had to relocate. The government decided, the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, had the task of mobilizing the finances for that. And we went for the conventional sources and we realized that it's not gonna, it's not gonna cut it. It's not gonna happen. And we had to resort to investments for our citizenship by investment program to finance those programs. And I'm saying this because some of our international partners sometimes question, why is it that we pursue that development path? But the truth is there's just not enough money from ODAs. There's not enough money from grants. There's not enough concessional financing that can allow us to build the resilience that we need. So having the responsibility of relocating 356 families at almost half a million, half a billion, sorry, dollars, we had to get it financed. So we can go to the COP and we can talk about the GCF and loss and damage and adaptation they're not going to give us the money. The CDB is a good partner, have helped us. But we've had to be very, become very creative. And we must say that after the storm, we were able to build bridges. Well, literal, physical bridges crossing rivers, you know, Dominica, lots of those. <laughs> so we were able to build bridges. And one bridge that stood up after Hurricane Maria showed us that taking the right decision, being driven by the science, the engineering, what we need to do, we can build not only better but smarter, but it comes at a cost. Again, it came from our CBI funds. No development partner was able to provide that to us. Obviously, we are grateful for, for the support that we continue to receive. We continue to invest heavily in a number of areas to build resilience. Housing, as I said, but healthcare services, smart health centers, schools that are now resilient. We've seen some of them being built in recent times. Our water system is being upgraded to ensure that we have adequate supply, to ensure that we can use renewable energy to generate some of the power required to keep them operating, especially those in very remote areas. So we continue to make all of these investments to ensure that we can build resilience. But as I said, financing, that is where, where the challenge is. And I'm going to, before I, I close, speak to one 
area in particular which I am, in which I am intimately involved, and that is how do we ensure that we keep the lights on? And how do we ensure, we had a very interesting discussion with a panel today on resilience in the energy sector. And although, as I said earlier today, it was limited to electricity, but how do we build resilience in that area? And I want to give you a little, a little story on this. So we are building a 10 megawatt geothermal power plant in the south of the island. And I wanted to invite all of you there tomorrow, but um, they told me you're busy. And Saturday, this, well, oh, I just remember you live until after independence. So we'll have time. So we're building this plant, and we're very excited that the, the drilling rig arrived last weekend, and we'll be, we started moving all of the equipment to the Rosa Valley. But just so you know, I want to give you a sense of this. We had to invest over two, no, sorry, two million US, yes. The Minister of Finance is there, so he wants to make sure that I count in correctly. About two million US to ensure that we have proper access to the, to the Rosa Valley, to Loda, where we're actually going to build the plant. So in the, in the last few weeks, several weeks, we have invested about, about two million US just for access to ensure the road, the rig can get through our difficult roads, the, the bends, the, the tiny roads, and the road, road failures from since Tropical Storm Erika and then made worse by Hurricane Maria. So we've had to make that investment. But we also found out that in order to take the power from the Rosa Valley onto the grid, we must upgrade our network. We don't have the capacity, the lines don't have the capacity to carry that power. So we have to upgrade the network. We designed the best possible, most resilient grid, well, sorry, transmission system, ensuring that we have redundancy built into that system because we also have in the Rosa Valley the source of hydropower. So this will become the center of power generation in Dominica. Therefore, we need to ensure that it is secured. We need to ensure that we build in resilience in that system. But in order to be able to develop or construct two transmission lines that will give us that redundancy, we're looking at 32 million US dollars, just four kilometers. Well, a little more than that. But just to get down the hill, to on the ground and overhead, we have to, to make that investment. But the Dominica Electricity Services Company will tell you that if you do this, then the rate payer is going to pay. If they have to reflect that resilience factor into the investment, it is not sustainable. And therefore, we've been making the case, and I'm saying this here because I hope you can help me spread the word. We presented some time ago at a conference, Ambassador Barron, myself, and we came up with the concept of the vulnerability, the resilience gap. So we need to be able to meet the differential in cost between what is commercial and what is resilience. I want, I want us to start talking about that. Small island developing states need to make that case. We're going to Sham check. We should be going to COP27 with stronger cases for specific demands that we can make to those who have polluted, you know, our planet and have exacerbated the impact of climate change. We need to make that argument. And therefore, we found ourselves at a very, in a very difficult position where in order to fully maximize the power that we will be producing in, in the Rosa Valley to get to the Kempinski Hotel in Portsmouth, we need to make another investment on transmission systems. And we found out that the cheapest route will be about, I'm not going to lie, about 40 million US from Focal A to get to here. And if we want to make it resilient, 49 million. Because we also found out that in order to get to the north, we have to make that investment. And now we are, we will be on from November 5th, I was, I was informed, we will commence studies to determine geothermal potential in the north of the island. And therefore we have to make a calculation, what is best? Do we build a plant in the north or do we bring the transmission system to the north? They're both very costly options, by the way, very costly options. But one will give us resilience as I've been advised by the CEO of Greed. And therefore, we need to consider that. But before all that excitement, we have to go to the Minister of Finance. And we're hoping that we can have a compelling case. But the truth is, 
Building resilience is expensive. Being able to take the science, the data, and to make the right policies, and most importantly, to implement them, is very costly. So as we seek to bring more science and data-driven approaches to policy formulation for resilience, we need to ensure that we spend some time talking about the financing. So Kim, the next time we meet, I'm hoping that we can challenge the IDB and our partners at the CDB to work with us together with the World Bank, the GCF, and all the international development banks, the international financial institution, and change the language. Let us change the approach. Stop, stop fantasizing about transition sorry, to renewable energy. I love it. I've been doing it for the last 10, 15 years. That's my focus. That's the area of my own research. But geez, we need to be realistic in these islands. And we need to ensure that it's affordable, accessible, and most importantly, resilient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Henderson. As you have interacted with um, Minister Henderson in the last, well, over the course of today and even from this evening, you can feel his passion for climate resilience and renewable energy. And we thank you very much for your leadership at the ministry. This evening, we are very pleased to welcome Mr. Isaac Solomon, the Vice President of the Caribbean Development Bank, who is this evening our keynote speaker. And I would like to invite, oh, he, I'm sorry, he's joining us virtually. Uh, <laughs> I've been looking around the room. Uh, but we would like to, to welcome um, Mr. Solomon, Vice President of the Caribbean Development Bank, who is joining us virtually this evening for the keynote address. Mr. Solomon, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Honorable Rosemary Sherrod, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Mrs. Sherrod, Honorable Francine Barron, Chief Executive Officer of Creed, Your Worship, Kerry Brady Friend, Mayor of Portsmouth, Ms. Karine Privo, Acting Secretary to Cabinet, Permanent Secretaries, Mrs. Kim Osborne, Executive Secretary for Integral, Integral Development, Sedi OAS, Pastor Eddie George, members of the media, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I wish to begin by expressing my sincere thanks to Prime Minister Roosevelt Scarrett and the Climate Resilience Executing Agency for the Omnica Creed for the invitation to deliver the keynote address at this special and timely seminar on building a science and database agenda for decision making on resilience in the Caribbean, hosted by the OAS Secretariat for Integral Development in collaboration with the Inter-American Institute for Global Change, Research, and Creed. It is my pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of President Dr. Hedges, the executive management team, and the staff. I need to put an extra because I realize not only am I missing out on an inspiring conversation, but also a free hotel stay. I am with you. And CDB is pleased to be represented in person by Mr. Paul Saunders, the Operations Officer, Environmental Sustainability. Firstly, I commend the government and people of the Commonwealth of Dominica for demonstrating global and regional leadership in the resilience mission. These are imperatives not only for our present and our future, but for our very survival. As I reflected on the focus of this today event, I considered how central decision-making is to what I will call the resilient race, and would like to offer some perspectives. 
I describe it as a race because we are on a rapid course to raise our resilience to the next level. Resilience is the key to neutralizing the risk facing our economies and achieving the sustainability necessary for thriving as a region. This is a race that we can win, but it will take urgent individual and collective action, including accelerating the shift to evidence-based decision-making and greater employment of innovation. I believe it is apt to start by reinforcing what we as a region are up against and the ground we need to cover to meet the sustainable development goals. Every Caribbean citizen or resident is aware of the high level of exposure and vulnerability of the region to multiple natural hazards, whether climate related like hurricanes and flooding or geophysical such as volcanic eruptions. As a region that is primarily made up of small islands, developing and low-lying coastal states, and with a large proportion of the population living within five kilometers of the coast, and most economic assets found in coastal areas, the Caribbean faces severe threats from rising sea levels, heat waves, coastal flooding, tropical storms, and major hurricanes. Many of us experienced the occurrence of one, if not several, natural hazard events. We have also seen or heard of their significant environmental, economic, and social impacts in the region. None of us can forget the magnitude of the destruction caused by the earthquakes in Haiti, the explosive eruption of La in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and the absolute devastation caused by Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Marion right here in Dominica, and other Category 5 hurricanes which have affected multiple countries in recent years. These adverse events have overturned years of hard-earned development gains and hindered the well-being and safety of persons and communities in the affected countries. Unfortunately, climate risk and potential impacts on the Caribbean will likely intensify in the future given that climate models indicate the continued increase in the sea surface temperature, rising sea levels, and an increase in the frequency of extreme weather events, particularly major hurricanes ranging from category three to five. This should send a strong signal about the urgency and necessity of building the region's resilience. Without urgent, coordinated, and intensified action to reduce disaster risk, and improve our ability to rebound from shock events, achievement of the SDGs is unlikely for many Caribbean countries. This raises an important question. What are the milestones that must be reached in the race for resilience? Firstly, as countries take more and more steps to build resilience, we must ensure that the process is fully inclusive. On this occasion, I wish to emphasize that we need interoperability throughout the collective resilience building course. Given its multi-dimensions, everyone would agree that the range of stakeholders playing a vital role in the creation of a resilient Caribbean is necessarily vast and must be inclusive. Sectors and systems, institutions and communities need to speak with each other. I know that it is easy to say that we need to work more quickly. But what should that be in practice? In their guidance on building resilient societies, the United Nations Sustainable Group affirms certain key elements of resilient building. Understanding the multidimensional risk and context, having interconnected systems, multiple stakeholders, and resilience capacities. So in navigating the resilience race course, we need deliberate actions that cut across multiple avenues and streams, including connected processes, entry points for cross-sectoral and collab collaborative work in common analysis, risk assessment, and building of community adaptive capacity. CDB has scaled up the comprehensive approach to supporting resilience building in the region. Our updated strategic plan, 2022-24, lays out clear commitments to five key pillars of resilience, environmental, social, production, financial, and institutional. 
These thematic areas link to priorities for development across a wide range of sectors, such as energy, agriculture, water and sanitation, education, and transport, underpinned by evidence-based decision-making and innovation, including digitalization as key facilitators, along with governance, gender equality, and regional corporate and integration as cost fertility. The bank is in the process of constructing a major knowledge management initiative to help accelerate innovation-led sustainable development as we maneuver the race for resilience. In collaboration with partners, CD-based promote tools that better capture the vulnerability and resilience of the small state and developing countries. The CDB framework comprises an internal resilience capacity metric, which assesses a country's capacity for rebounding from shock events. Two, the recovery duration adjuster, a methodology that evaluates length of that recovery period. And three, the vulnerability and resilience assessment tool. This framework promotes a rethinking of the eligibility criteria for concessional financing for sales. And it promises to generate rich, evidence-based data that will also support processes of decision-making and execution in the resilient race. So, Minister Henderson, we are actually changing the conversation which you alluded to earlier. I thought another but to drive better decision making or evidence to embrace our confidence in our determinations. Decision making to reduce the impact of the hazards which played our country as a best in a form by quantitative risk assessment, if potential risk, followed by steps to eliminate to the about how the future can cope as the severity with which climate related and the events will continue to impact us. We must strengthen of that party to enable timely recovery from that. We must also improve coordination with the region that material services among the and national partners. The foundation for resilience of the economic development is that will lead to the with the different Data and information drive innovation, create knowledge, and inform and explain of climate change impacts and addressing other key development issues. They form the basis for being relevant and coherent policies, strategies, and plans to reduce poverty, promote economic growth, social equity, and sustainable development. This includes improving the ability to prepare for, absorb, recover from, and more successfully adapt to disruptive events. And this is not just about having the data, but also understanding what the data is telling us. It has been widely noted that SIDS lack comprehensive data to identify and attribute environmental impacts to climate change processes and to optimally formulate scenarios to aid decision making under uncertainty. Under such circumstances, there is a lack of maladaptation, whereby interventions targeted, there's a risk, sorry, of maladaptation, whereby interventions targeted at one location, sector, or community result in increased vulnerability as well. Let me emphasize, key economic sectors in the Caribbean, such as agriculture, water, tourism, transportation, energy, health, and therefore equal environment. Global time and climate impact this forecasting models are required to better understand current and projected climate economic sectors. Documented potential risks at the regional, national, and local levels are fundamental to inform not only the design of resilient infrastructure across these various sectors, but also the development of effective early warning systems 
to save lives and reduce damage and loss of infrastructure, properties, and livelihoods. Earlier this year, researchers at the University of the West Indies and the University of Bonn published a paper presenting their research on the implications for beach tourism in the Caribbean as a result of sea level rise under the various global climate change scenarios. Given that sandy beaches are a key factor in the decision by many to visit the Caribbean, the researchers sought to explore the cost of management strategies to mitigate the impact of the loss of beach width under the various scenarios. While the study and its findings were instructive, the authors highlighted numerous data limitations which affected the quality of information available to policymakers for decision making on adaptation strategies. In another domain, the role of insurance in communicating the risk inherent in the development of housing and infrastructure particular locations is most effective where data is available to permit assessment of the exposure, vulnerability, the, and the resilience of assets. And the development of such data sets presents useful tools to influence adaptation. Such data covers a range of themes, such as the environment, geology, topography, and social. And Combined with effective analytics, insurance pricing could be more precisely targeted. Recent years, with the support of develop tools to help with the resilience of the digital market. Road resilience index combined with the road sector and resilience index. Is that a little bit more designed to help or borrow the country chart pathways for resilience women? Similarly, the water selection program and resilience in the water supply sector. The soundness of decisions made using tools such as these is greatly enhanced by the availability of good quality data as inputs to the process. I call on all of us to support data driven innovation across pillars of resilience as fundamental to adapting and responding appropriately to, to climate change conditions. New technologies offer an opportunity to make data and information more accessible, to customize products and services for interested parties, and to stimulate transfer of knowledge, creativity, and innovation in our businesses, in our business and operations. The COVID-19 pandemic has triggered a substantial uptake in the adoption and use of new technologies. We should keep the momentum and ensure these technologies become more accessible, affordable, and tailored to our regional context. The CDB is determined to continue playing its leading role in this process. We have been engaged in several productive partnerships such as with the Climate Studies Group, MONA, at the University of the West Indies, to prepare and publish the State of the Caribbean Climate Report in 2020. This is a high quality reference report compiling reliable climate data and information to support planning and decision making across the multiple sectors in the region. We are supporting the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center vulnerable Caribbean coastal assets using LIDAR technology. LIDAR data can be used, for instance, to integrate nature-based solutions into disaster risk management and coastal zone management planning in support of strengthening the climate resilience in the region. This evening, I want to stress that we cannot stay in the race without climate change and data and information and continue operating uncertainty. Certain and sustained efforts and necessities to support the collection, processing, and dissemination of data and information that are required to build resilience and achieve sustainable development in the region. This cannot be achieved single-handedly, and we heard that earlier. All stakeholders, whether academic institutions, government and non-governmental agencies, development agencies and donors, local communities, indigenous groups or vulnerable groups 
should be fully involved and play their part. As such, it is paramount that strategic partnerships among key stakeholders be prioritized to harness expertise and mobilize adequate finance to strengthen institutional capacities for the production and management of data and knowledge in the region. Importantly, data gathering must involve communities and vulnerable groups. Indigenous knowledge should be factored into sustainable approaches to vulnerability reduction and resilience building. Despite the magnitude of challenges that we are facing, I remain confident that we can collectively contribute to enhancing the work, producing other data and information, advancing the creation of knowledge and making substantial progress in building a more resilient Caribbean. As we strive to reach the finish line, we must also strive to sustain our ability to adapt as there is constant change. I thank you for your attention and wish you a very productive seminar. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon, who has joined us virtually for this conference and opening ceremony today. We do want to thank you as well for the role that CDB is playing in Dominica in the region, particularly in the area of building resilient infrastructure. And of course, we also want to thank um, you and the CDB for your role in supporting CREED and other climate resilient initiative or initiatives on island. Um, of course we do have to build some more resilience for technology um, but that is a, is a process. We apologize for the quality of the audio but we do thank Mr. Solomon for his remarks. At this time, um, unfortunately some of you may not be able to stay for two weeks. Um, some of you may not be able to stay for a week. So for those of you who have to leave soon, we would like to share some of our culture with you today and we have with us a representation of the sixth form Cicero singers who will now share some cultural entertainment this evening. Thank you. 
very much to the C7 singers and that was just a taste so you can just imagine what the next few days are going to be like um, if you would like a translation um, simply the first song says thank God there is no other place as beautiful as this place it is a paradise that's in summary and our next speaker can probably translate a bit more for you. <laughs> but at least you have an idea of what um, the C7 singers sang thank you very much to the C7 singers for this rendition at this time, we would like to invite uh, our champion for climate resilience in Dominica and in the Caribbean, Honorable Roosevelt Skerry, the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, to deliver the future address. Well, you know, I was, my manager called me to say that um, the OS wanted me to perform at this event. <laughs> um, but um, I was told I could not afford my fees. <laughs> you know. So um, next time, you know. But I'm very happy to be here. I want to recognize in our presence, Honorable Joseph Isaac, the Speaker of the House of Assembly. Honorable Dr. Vince Henderson, Minister for Planning, Economic Development, and Renewable Energy. My other cabinet colleagues, Your Excellency Francine Barron, Chief Executive Officer of Creed, Mrs. Kim Osborne, Executive Secretary for Integral Development, Ms. Karim Prevo, Acting Secretary to the Cabinet, Permanent Secretaries, Mr. Isaac Solomon, Vice President of the Caribbean Development Bank, Pastor Eddie George, members of the media, distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen, wonderful to have you here in our country. I want to warmly welcome all of you, particularly those of you who are visiting the Nature Island of the Caribbean for the first time. From your vantage point, you're surrounded by terrestrial and marine ecosystems, which comprise a significant component of the Carbridge National Park. The Carbridge National Park was established in 1986 as a protected area to preserve the built heritage and the rich ecosystem of flora and fauna that thrive both within the marine and land environment. In Dominica, we have always paid detailed attention to the preservation of our cultural heritage and the natural environment. 
long before the issue of climate change came about. Dominica has had a tradition and a history of protecting our environment. As we gather here, preparations are ongoing for the celebration of our 45th anniversary of independence. The highlight of which will be our World Creole Music Festival next weekend. And as my friend Dr. Henderson and of course Francine Barron and others uh, have told you, you are free to extend your stay uh, to partake in these exciting times. Dominica is one of the unique countries where our independence is on the 4th, 3rd of November, but we start celebrating on the 1st of September. Um, so, so we do have months and weeks of celebration. In support of our natural heritage, we have protected and managed our forest and celebrate 60%, 60% forest coverage. We maintain two major national parks and two marine protected areas, which have required a societal approach with strong leadership from the state and local communities. And just for your own edification, one of the marine reserves is located in a fishing village. And we have had very strong community adherence to protecting this marine reserve, which is in itself a paradox. And the fishermen there in the community have respected this marine reserve in the village of Scotshead. The latest intergovernmental panel on climate change observed that human-induced climate change, including more frequent and intense extreme climate events, have caused widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damage to the natural environment and people. Dominica has had more than its share with these disastrous climate events. Within the past seven years, we have had two major destructive cyclones, Tropical Storm Erica in 2015 and Hurricane Maria in 2017. Together, together, these two weather systems erased more than 300% of our country's gross domestic product. And it is an amazing story that we can tell as to why we are standing today. In the aftermath of, of Storm Erica, nine communities were declared disaster zones, with two of these communities requiring immediate evacuation and resettlement. We were still in the process of rebuilding post Erica when Category 5 Hurricane Maria struck. The lives lost from these two weather systems was approximately 100 people. Our beautiful island had suffered from cascading natural disasters. And to compound this, we are still navigating through the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a small island developing state with an open economy, we are vulnerable both to the devastation of climate change and the disruption brought about by external shocks. Perhaps conversely, as a result of our small size, we are per perhaps best placed to develop an all of society approach and devise workable solutions. Confronted by these challenges and their negative consequences, we have expressed a bold vision to build our country as the first climate resilient nation of the world. And the reality is, my dear friends, is that we do not want people to remember us based on what happened to us, but more so for our response to what happened to us. We have established a policy, the strategic and planning framework, to give meaning and life to this vision. We have also established a Climate Resilience Execution Agency for Dominica, CREED, to guide our resilience journey. And much has been achieved, I can tell you, in the five years since Hurricane Maria. <clears throat> and I should add, in line with what Dr. Henderson indicated, with about 99% of the funds 
being from our treasury or Dominica. Right. Our experience from successive weather systems has demonstrated the vulnerability of our critical assets to floods and land, landslide damage. We have carefully studied the characteristics of these occurrences and have incorporated into our rebuilding process resilience measures to mitigate losses. The protection of our people and their livelihoods is paramount. As you deliberate on the various challenges that we face in making our region more resilient, you must bear in mind the issues of citizen resiliency and how we can provide relevant and timely information to them that will help them make decisions to build their own resilience and that of their communities. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, there are substantial issues that must be addressed to make Dominica and indeed our Caribbean region more resilient, particularly to the impacts of climate change. I am therefore extremely pleased that these conversations are taking place now. Science and data must drive both our mitigation and adaptation actions. We must act not only on what we know now, but what the science tells us we must prepare for in the future. To warn. In Dominica, we have developed a national resilience development strategy and climate resilience and recovery plan. And one of the key initiatives in, is to develop a center of excellence for data in resilience decision making. This involves, among other things, the establishment of a dedicated geographical information systems unit within our Ministry of Planning, which will support the institutionalizing, institutionalizing of a data-driven approach to all key planning decisions. Given our country's geography and topography, many of our communities are located along hillsides and slopes, in valleys and floodplains, and within the reach of dangerous sea surges. Our vulnerabilities and response capabilities must therefore be properly mapped and frequently updated. I am encouraged to know that one of the topics of discussion at this conference is building resilience with geospatial intelligence. It is of vital importance that we are able to adequately assess our risk and have access to credible and accurate data sources that will inform actions to minimize and mitigate the impacts of disasters and improve our resilience, particularly to extreme weather events. Ultimately, how well we weather and bounce back from extreme events will depend on how prepared we are and having the right data that informs our actions is critical to that process. We recognize also the importance of energy and resilient energy systems to energy security and economic development. Dominica is committed to attaining 100% domestic renewable energy production by 2030. Much of this will be achieved utilizing our significant geothermal reserves, which will serve not only to provide clean energy, but also spur our green industrialization. We are, we are actively considering the production of green hydrogen within our first green industrial eco-park that is being supported by the Green Climate Fund. We experienced significant disruptions to energy supply post Hurricane Maria, which delayed our recovery. As we build back better and build greater resilience, we are tackling issues of hardening the grid, undergrounding of electrical lines and battery storage capacity, among others. We hope, my dear friends, that the discussions here today and tomorrow will provide practical outcomes to the challenges that the region faces in its electricity sector from extreme 
weather events. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality is that climate change is already upon us. In the region, we're extremely, well, we're already dealing with its impacts. Not only are we seeing stronger, larger, more frequent storms, but more intense droughts, record heat waves, evasive species, among others. The fact that the world's major polluters are not taking sufficient action to halt global warming beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius makes it imperative that we accelerate action and our own efforts towards building resilience. Because the reality is, if we wait for them to take action, we will all be dead in these small islands. And therefore, we have to take action by ourselves to build greater resilience. That's the bottom line. And next month, leaders will meet in Egypt for yet another COP. This one is called COP27. <laughs> to discuss all of these issues. We hope that the, the data that is continuously being generated will provide the impetus to countries to significantly cut the emissions. We in the Caribbean are doing our part, but our contribution to global warming is negligible compared to the corresponding impact on us. In the real world, you would take these people to court <laughs> and they would compensate you. I hope we don't have to get to that point. I hope, my dear friends, that the recommendations that will come forth from your discussions over these two days will provide valuable insight and a pathway for ensuring that the actions that we take to build our collective resilience in the region is informed by the best science available. Consistent with the resilience building agenda of the Commonwealth of Dominica, I fully commit myself personally and my personal support and that of the government of Dominica for the implementation of the outcomes of this conference. I am mindful that it has benefited from the input of expertise from national, regional, and international agencies. We will intercede where necessary and required with inter inter intergovernmental organizations and international financial institutions to mobilize support for this initiative. Permit me also to say, to say this, it is my firm opinion that Caribbean governments should be doing a lot more to learn from each other. I believe, I believe this is among the key deficiencies that separate us from other regional blocs like Asia and the Pacific. Dominica is fully prepared to share the lessons and experiences from its efforts at becoming the first climate resilient nation in the world. It is our firm desire to see the Caribbean become the first climate resilient region in the world. And so I am putting a challenge to our regional organizations like CARICOM, the OECS, CANARI, CIMH, CDEMO, the Five Cs, and others like the OAS and NOAA to set up a climate resilient action learning program around the activities of our creed here in Dominica. And I can tell you, so serious I am about this, that I intend to table resolutions on this, first in my cabinet and then our parliament, and thereafter in the OECS and CARICOM, because I believe we must learn together or we will stagnate apart. The reality of climate change is here. And every one of our countries in the Caribbean is vulnerable. And therefore, we have an opportunity 
to learn from each other, learn from lived experiences, so that we can better position our countries and our citizens to deal with the impacts of climate change. And so I thank the Organization of American States, OS, and in particular, Mrs. Kim Osborne and her team, Creed, and the Inter-American Institute for Global Climate Research for bringing some of the best minds in the region together to have this discussion in Dominica. I wish you a successful conference and trust that you will continue to enjoy your stay here in our beautiful nature island. I thank you for journeying here to the, in Dominica and for being part of this very noble engagement. What you're doing here, I will say to you, my dear participants, is extremely important and urgent. We all need this in this hemisphere. We all need this in this world, particularly those of us who are suffering from the impacts of climate change. And I wish you all the best. May God bless our efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Honorable Prime Minister, who has clearly articulated some of our climate resilience initiatives in Dominica and our targets, and of course has also articulated his vision to extend some of these programs through the region. We are certain that under your leadership, we will achieve these goals that we have set for 2030 and beyond. At this time, as we wrap up this um, segment of the, of the conference, of the opening ceremony, I would like to just take this opportunity to thank a few persons who have made today uh, possible. Of course, uh, the OAS, Organization of American States, for spearheading this conference in partnership in partnership with the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, Amazon Web Services and, and Creed, and these have been our main partners for this conference. We want to thank uh, Ms. Kim Osborne for leading the charge with her team at Creed, and um, no coincidence, her friend, Honorable Baron, um, also for leading the team at Creed, and of course, all of your staff, and your entire team at Creed for organizing and working on this conference. We also want to thank in a special way the staff of the Office of the Prime Minister, the Permanent Secretary, and Ms. Dion Dira, our Press Secretary, who I know has worked very hard in, in putting some of these arrangements together. We want to thank, of course, the management and staff of the Kimpinski Hotel, who have hosted you. Um, of course, this time, show for you has been a wonderful stay at the Kempinski Hotel. We would like to thank, um, of course, for today, our speakers, led by the Honorable Prime Minister, for um, addressing us this evening, Honorable Francine Barron, Dr. Vince Henderson, Ms. Kim Osborne, and Mr. Isaac Solomon of the CDB for their remarks this evening at the opening ceremony conference. We want to thank, as well, the media, who I see you are here in full force this evening, we thank you very much for spreading the message of climate resilience in Dominica. And of course, we would like to thank those who have joined us virtually via Zoom and uh, via our various social media platforms. But of course, I would like to thank very much those of you who have joined us in person in Dominica and at the Kimpinski Hotel. We want to thank, of course, all of our invited guests and all the participants of this opening ceremony uh, this evening. So give yourselves a round of applause for being here. I would just like to inform you that we will be having a few cocktails on our left in the lounge area, so you are invited to join us at the lounge for cocktails. Just one announcement, I do have some keys that were left in the conference area, so if you are missing your keys or unable to get your vehicle, please contact me at the end of this session. <laughs> but most of you are staying here at the Kipitsky, so you don't need any keys. Thank you very much to everyone and have a pleasant evening.